Studies have identified nearly 17,000 seniors in Shelby County that aren't sure where their next meal is coming from. Tonight on The Best Times, we take a final look at the progress of the No Hungry Senior Program. And we'll give you advice on estate planning. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plough Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. Most of us never really know real hunger. We never live with an empty stomach and the empty feeling of not knowing where the next meal is coming from. In 2015, the Plough Foundation funded the No Hungry Senior Program. Its goal was to identify and feed seniors in Shelby County that are food insecure. 2018 is the final year of the grant, and tonight on The Best Times, we examine the impact of the No Hungry Senior Program. Most people don't understand when you say hunger. Uh, no one's hungry in this country. You know, this is the land of plenty. What we found in our interviews with people when we ask, have you ever been hungry? They say no. But if you ask, have you ever skipped a meal? The answer is yes. Have you ever had not enough to eat? The answer is yes. Have you ever gone a day without eating? The answer is yes. The number of people in Memphis who don't know where their next meal is coming from is eye-opening. According to the organization Feeding America, 17% of households in Tennessee are food insecure. That puts our state as one of 12 in the country with higher than average rates of food insecurity. In Shelby County, the problem is greater. Over 20% of the total population is food insecure. The impact of food insecurity goes far beyond mere hunger. Statistics from Feeding America show that 60% of food insecure seniors are more likely to experience depression. 53% are more likely to report a heart attack. 52% more likely to develop asthma and 40% are more likely to have congestive heart failure. It's estimated that food insecurity adds $160 billion to the cost of health care in this country every year. In 2015, the Plow Foundation's Aging Initiative awarded a grant to eight agencies in the Memphis area to develop the No Hungry Senior Project. MIFA is the lead agency in this collaboration. Floria Robinson is a No Hungry Senior client. She receives a weekly delivery of shelf-stable foods from MIFA volunteers. Each box contains food for seven meals, four breakfasts and three lunches or dinners, plus some snacks. The total cost of this box is $9.50. As of March 2018, the No Hungry Senior Program has served 1,750 clients since the program began. Over half a million meals have been served. Demographically, no hungry senior clients are an average of 76 years old, African American females, with a third of them living alone, and half of them living on less than $1,000 a month. Currently, the program is serving 980 clients, but the future of their meal deliveries is in doubt because the No Hungry Senior Program is only funded through the end of 2018. To find out more about what happens next, I interviewed three representatives of the No Hungry Senior Collaborative. Well, this is the, the fourth year of the Plow Foundation's grant. Um, for a moment, just, just step back from the program. Give me the big picture of now into the fourth year of the entire program. Where does it stand? 
Um, well, of course, we're very grateful to the Plow Foundation for this grant to meet this great need in our community. Um, it was always about uh, helping to serve seniors at the highest risk of food insecurity. MIFA had had meals, the Meals on Wheels program since 1976, but we knew we weren't meeting the need. There was still an enormous gap, and the need in Shelby County, we estimate there are over 4,000 seniors who um, could really benefit from home-delivered meals. And the need in Shelby County is so great because um, of our high poverty rate, the, the number of seniors who live alone, and the aging population is, is growing. So over the, the course of the program, we have been able to serve an additional 1,700 seniors, and that means um, 500,000 meals have been served over the years of the program. Uh, now this is a collaborative effort. As a matter of fact, we have two of the collaborators here, but who's been involved in this? How has this collaboration worked? From the beginning, it was important that this program be collaborative because we wanted to learn from partners and we knew the more hands and the more minds at the table, the better we'd be able to meet the need and the more we would learn. So there was a long period of planning and just meeting before we really actually began service. And our partners include, um, we're real excited, the two uh, major healthcare systems, Methodist Healthcare and Baptist Memorial Healthcare the Aging Commission of the Mid-South, wh who refers clients, um, the Mid-South Food Bank, who helped us with our uh, shelf-stable meal service, the um, Catholic Charities helped with volunteers, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish Federation, Jewish Community Partners, the University of Memphis School of Public Health, who has served as our outside evaluator, and CoActionNet um, uh, provides our database. So a considerable number of contributors to yes. this program. Tell me, what does a typical recipient of this food look like? Is there, can you draw me a profile? Sure, 61% um, of your average, your average client is female, African American. Um, so about 61% are female and uh, about 70% uh, or more are African American. Um, that 33 percent of them are widows or widowers um, and the majority over half of them actually live on less than a thousand dollars a month um, the average age is about 76 although we have had seniors who were over a hundred we had a hundred six year old uh, gentleman who was in the program um, and we had about a third of the, the participants are over 85, so they are elderly. Uh, a lot of them have health complications, so, you know, I, we all know that hypertension and diabetes are common in the, the Mid-South. However, uh, it's really common among this population. 82% have hypertension, and, uh, and uh, I think of the diabetics, I think it's about 45% uh, have diabetes, so getting meals that are nutritious and that are low sodium, um, it's really important. Do any of those figures about the, the profile of a mm -hmm. typical recipient, do they surprise you in any way? Um, not really, no. no. Uh, I think because as Sally had said, you know, our aging population is growing and that we have such high poverty rates here that, no, it's, it's not surprising at all. Now, you mentioned the Aging Commission. I know the Aging Commission has a waiting list. Mm -hmm. Uh, they've had a waiting list year on year on year. Have you been able to make a dent in that waiting list with this program? Uh, yes, the size of that waiting list was one of the uh, an impetus for this uh, grant to begin with because compared to other areas in the country, our, our waiting list was so enormous. So when we began, I think they estimated their waiting list was at about 3,000 and um, today it's closer to 1,200. So you've been able to make a dent. Mm -hmm. But, but there's not, still a lot left. Right. Plus, more people are being added to right. that list. Right, okay. right. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned um, elements like um, disease. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the fact that this is more than just about food and eating and being hungry and satisfying hunger because there's an emotional component to this mm -hmm. and there's also the physical component. So, talk a little bit about how a program like this affects people on that emotional and, and health level. Um, I know in, in the hospital, um, I work for Methodist Healthcare, and um, 
patients are so appreciative of having a stable source of, of food. Um, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of them, like you said, are alone. Uh, they have difficulty preparing meals. Um, in fact, I have an example. Um, Mr. Jones is an 80-year-old gentleman, and um, he was admitted to Methodist um, last December. Multiple falls, he had a history of diabetes, stroke, and <coughs> when he came in, he was considered by insurance to be too high-functioning to qualify for a skilled nursing facility. Um, but he was also in too poor physical condition to go grocery shopping or to prepare meals for himself. And so this program really offered him the opportunity to get the nutrition that he needed um, and to have some interaction <laughs> with people who were delivering the meals. Um, and he started on that program in January when he was discharged from the hospital. He has not been readmitted since. <laughs> well, speaking of that, what, what's What's the significant data you're seeing for the program so far? Sure. So we looked at the main outcomes we wanted to see were did, did getting this food service improve health or at least maintain health of these seniors? We didn't expect to see vast improvements, but we wanted to make sure that people were able to uh, to, to feel better, you know, to have some health maintenance, uh, and to be able to stay in their homes. Uh, so those were some of the things we wanted to look at. So when they enter into the program, they get a full assessment in terms of their, their nutritional needs, uh, their social support, uh, their self-perceived health, the numbers of times they've been in the hospital or gone to the emergency room. We ask a, a range of questions. And then every year at the at their anniversary of entering the program, we do a reassessment. And then we also do a satisfaction survey. And so what we were seeing from the numbers pretty consistently from the, the second year on was that the seniors were reporting less hospitalizations and they were reporting less emergency room visits. Uh, and so that looked really good to us. Uh, they were also reporting less loneliness uh, because we use a loneliness scale to assess you know, whether or not they, they are lonely um, and less loneliness. So, so uh, we thought this looks really good, but this is self-report and you know, sometimes people don't remember events and so we really wanted to find out you know, how accurate that was. So fortunately, with Methodist as one of our partners, Methodist said that you know, we could look with them at their data to see that. So we looked at about 225 patients who had been referred by Methodist into the program, and we looked at what their healthcare utilization was before they entered the program, a year before they entered the program, and the year after you know, that they entered the program. And what we found was, was pretty uh, startling because it actually confirmed what the, the clients had told us themselves. There really was less utilization. Um, we, uh, we looked at the data and for every month that a person was in the program, their healthcare utilization declined. So it was a nice solid uh, slope, uh, a downward slope uh, for that. And also the, the utilization costs. So f also for every month in the program, utilization costs went down $345. So we're saving hospitals and saving Medicare money by providing food to these seniors. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the kind of data you were never able to achieve as, as MIFA or as uh, the Memphis Food Bank or anyone. You don't have access to that kind of data, do you? Right. It, it was important for us to build a valuation in for part of this <coughs> project, but really exciting. Um, that uh, the partnership with Methodist and the collaboration made this possible and we're really grateful because Methodist, this was an add-on. They just, yeah. you know, got interested in the program and, and as a partner and said, well, let's take a deeper look. And so three years in, and we're able to see some significant mm -hmm. findings. Give me some details on how the healthcare systems, Methodist in particular, how does it integrate in, how does it fit into this program? How does it work? Well, it's another team effort. <laughs> our great nurses will screen our patients for us um, for nutritional risks. So things like unintentional weight loss, um, decline in appetite, um, being underweight or having pressure wounds when they come into the hospital. And when they find those things um, for patients who've been admitted, they consult the dietitian or the diet technician. And we go and interview the patient and we do a food insecurity screen. So we'll ask them 10 quick questions to determine if they are food insecure. And if they meet those criteria, 
um, we offer them this program. We so get you're their actually consent. identifying people in the hospital setting exactly. and then <clears throat> tending to them. Is there follow-up after that that you have or? Right, so we um, before they're discharged, we have these great grocery boxes that have been provided by the food bank um, that contain seven shelf-stable meals. And so it's kind of a bridge until um, MIFA and the food bank can start providing meals as well. And did I hear you say earlier that it's had an impact on hospital readmissions? It has. What has been the impact? Um, we've had decrease in emergency room visits, decrease um, in length of stay, um, 30 day readmissions, um, you know, when the patient returns to the hospital, if they do return to the hospital, we have less incidence of fall and the patient is more weight stable. Now I understand that you're partnering with Methodist for some more information, additional information to what we just talked about. Well, and this is, Deb may speak to that, but this is the research that we are, this is part of the research that we are seeing yeah, right. that. Right, yeah, so as Allison said, there's been de decreased inpatient um, uh, admissions. And when we looked at the data, I, I think I mentioned that we looked at a year before they entered the program and a year after. So there's a 34% decrease in inpatient admissions uh, compared to if you take any given patient, you know, uh, before and after. The, the average for those patients is, is a 34% decrease in, in admissions. So, you know, and that's, you know, what we were hearing from the patients themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, this, um, you're in the fourth year of the Plow Grant, mm -hmm. and the grant ends at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So what happens next? What happens next year? Uh, yes, as all grant funding does, it will come to an end. So we are really focused on sustain sustaining the program and sustaining service to seniors. Um, we hope this data uh, will help us attract future fun funders because um, it shows very clearly the impact of, of the program. and that something as basic as a meal, as basic as a volunteer checking on a homebound senior can make an enormous difference in that senior's life. We also are building on the program in that we're looking at um, other, other things, other ways we can impact these seniors. For instance, uh, you talked about loneliness and, and the fact that our, our seniors say they are less lonely with this program, and we thought, well, how can we can we do more? So this fall, we'll be launching a program called My Phone Buddy, and we will pair volunteers with some of our homebound seniors, and those volunteers will make additional calls and uh, safety checks. It will be really helpful to us during inclement weather because sometimes we're not able to get out, and so that volunteer can can call during that time. So. We want to continue to invest as we are able in the program and build on the data and continue to do that. Um, but the most important thing is what we can do to uh, continue to um, serve meals to these seniors because we don't want the waiting list at the Aging Commission just to uh, go back to where it was previously. Now, <clears throat> big picture, you've made a dent all of your efforts, uh, the No Hunger Senior Program has made a dent, but what would it take to put an end to food insecurity among the elderly? Well, I think we probably all have some ideas on that, and I think it would continue to be a, um, a, a collaborative approach from uh, healthcare, from the nonprofit community, uh, and then also from our, our government programs. Uh, Meals on Wheels is funded through the Older Americans Act, so we're concerned that uh, that funding remain. It has been a level which uh, in essence means declining because the need is growing, so um, you know we watch the funding for that program very carefully and, and always hope that there might be increases to that. It, SNAP, there are other programs that um, are very important for food insecurity. No, I think it is going to depend on continued federal funding. Uh, you, you really can't ask communities to do all of that work. And, and as Sally said, it's not an expensive program, but it results in uh, very significant uh, cost benefits 
And so I think if they look at that from the med from Medicare standpoint, it results in cost savings for Medicare. So I think they have to look, I think our legislators need to look at a bigger picture and not just at this individual uh, program for funding meals. Uh, they have to see what the impact of it is. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for being on The Best Times, talking about this important issue of food insecurity among the elderly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a will? What's the difference between a will and a living trust? And why should you appoint a power of attorney? These are just some of the elements of estate planning, a process that provides for the succession of your property according to your wishes. And it's not so much about the value of your property as it is about the value your property has to you and your heirs. What is estate planning? Well, estate planning is a process by which a person plans for incapacity or death. So a person is determining uh, who will make decisions for them if they can't make decisions for themselves. And a person is deci uh, making a decision as to who will receive their assets upon their death. The common estate planning documents are a last will and testament, a financial power attorney, a health care power attorney, and a living will. What are the advantages of having an estate plan? There's four basic advantages of estate planning. Number one is that it helps save on any estate or death taxes. Number two, it helps avoid the cost and time delay of probate. And then a third advantage is the fact that it ensures that the people you want to receive your assets actually receive your assets. And then the fourth advantage is it reduces the chance for conflict or dispute when you pass away. Is estate planning only for the wealthy? The short answer is no, because if a person has an excess of $50,000, which is the minimum probate amount, then you probably need an estate plan. But in general, from a practical standpoint, uh, probably estate planning is more beneficial to the wealthy. What happens if I die without a will? If you die without a will, then the cost of dying increases. There's bond premiums, inventory cost, appraisal fees, accountings, and also the time delay increases. Also, if you die without a will, then the state determines who receives your assets and who the executor of your estate is. What is a living trust? Well, a living trust is an alternative to a last will and testament. It is a trust. You have a trustee and you have a beneficiary. However, the difference is, number one, it's revocable, which means you can change at any time. And number two is that you are the trustee and you are the beneficiary, so you're in total control over the assets. And the primary purpose of a living trust is to avoid probate at death. What is a power of attorney? First, you have a power of attorney for finance. That power of attorney allows someone to make decisions for you regarding your finances, pay your bills, collect your income, manage your assets. And then most people also have a separate power of attorney for health care or personal care decision making. Allow someone to make medical decisions for you and also allow someone to make personal care decisions for you, such as if you have to go to rehab or go to a long-term care facility. Well, a durable power of attorney basically continues to be effective upon your incapacity whereas a non-durable power of attorney ceases to be effective when you become incapacitated. And an example of a non-durable power of attorney, let's say you're going on vacation and you need to sell your house while you're out of town, you would grant someone a non-durable power of attorney to handle things for you while you're out of town. How much does an estate plan cost? Most lawyers either charge a fixed fee for estate planning or they charge by the hour. If you're looking for a lawyer to do your estate planning, you need to ask the lawyer, how do you charge? I think most clients prefer fixed fees. That way they know it's a known quantity, they know what the amount is. But generally, your estate planning uh, fees are going to vary based on the size of your estate and the complexity of the estate plan that you need. Can I do it myself? The issue with DIY estate planning is that 
The forms are normally legal. They're valid. But all those forms have blanks. And the real question is, what do you put in the blanks? And that's what you pay the lawyer for, to know what answers to put in the blanks. For a good overview and advice on estate planning, go to the website of AARP or contact an attorney. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.